You're listening to The Quad, a Killjoys podcast. My name is Stephanie. And I'm Chris. We're talking about the fourth episode of season two of Killjoys, Schooled. While we will talk about anything and everything from the episode, there won't be any spoilers for future episodes. Let's get started with our quick reviews. What did you think about this episode, Chris? I like this episode. And, you know, yes, the brother parallels are kind of heavy handed, but I appreciate all the character dynamics that were featured, which is what I say every episode, but it's always true. I feel like Killjoys is really, really good about that. I'm somewhat amused that it seems to be the season of rotating guests on Lucy. Right. Because <laughs> now Potter is staying with them. It was Alvis before this, and it was pre before that. I mean, I don't mind at all. I think it's really entertaining. I think it's a good way for them to feature their supporting characters, which we spent the entirety of season one praising us and everybody else, I think. I mean, it's a great supporting cast. You might as well do it. Also, we get in this episode the return of Delsea and her rampant flirting with Dutch. There was so much flirting. Is Dutch going to make room in her bunk for Delsea to stay on, th- on Lucy next, huh? <laughs> no, not if ah. Dutch has any choice. <laughs> they hate flirting. And they actually, called it as such in this episode. That I made know. me so happy. And like, Dutch is the one who said it, which I think made it even better. <laughs> I, I mentioned to you earlier, this is before this episode aired, that like it occurred to me that Delsea and Dutch kind of reminded me of the Root and Shaw dynamic from Person of Interest, and I feel like this episode reinforced that. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. <laughs> so With- possibly it's only a matter of time. <laughs> <laughs> You're trying to give me hope. <laughs> Not necessarily. I just, I, hope is there, though. Yes, yes. <laughs> Based well- on that precedent. That's all I'm saying. Well, Dutch said she did not hate that kiss. And while I don't entirely know if I believe her, it did kind of make me go, hmm. Well, it was it was part of two truths and a lie. But Delcea doing her thing was like, it's not called three truths, Killjoy. (laughs) (laughs) So this episode was not my favorite. I liked it better on rewatch, but I think I'm just predisposed not to like it because I just do not like the plot device where it's like, here is an adorable little Moppet, and we're going to show you a softer side to a character. Because Stephanie does not like kids. (laughs) Like Dutch, I am uncomfortable with small people. (laughs) (laughs) Plus, I just find like whenever they do that storyline where there's suddenly a kid around for an episode, the writing just gets so heavy handed. Like what you were saying with the, the brother parallels, like, oh, they've got a dad who's a jerk, and you've got like the one who's like smart and the younger and one who's more like tough and physical just like Davin and Johnny and they even had that moment where Olin says to Johnny like oh you're the smart one right like oh, uh, oh. <laughs> and my other stab through the heart line was when Dutch made a grounded joke like no <laughs> we can have children in an episode and not use the tell him he's grounded line uh, anyway <laughs> <laughs> Stephanie really doesn't like children. <laughs> I don't like how they I don't like how they are often used in television. I feel like television writers do not write children well generally at all. Like they all struggle with them. They're either like these bratty they're, they're usually just so one-dimensional in regards to characters. So it's not really the children themselves. It's really how they're written. With the exception of Kira on Orphan Black, I was about I to say dearly. <laughs> You're one acceptable child. And she's my acceptable child because they treat her like an adult. Like, she acts like a small adult most of the time, you know? Anyway. Yeah, I know. So I wasn't a huge fan of this episode just because kids and kind of heavy-handed <laughs> plotting, but uh, there... So you felt about this episode the way I kind of felt about the last episode. Like, the the main plot, like, the mission part of the plot felt a little redundant, maybe? A little not great? <laughs> <laughs> It was definitely not my favorite mission of the week, sure, because it also felt a bit repetitive to me that this is like two weeks in a row where their perceived big threat turned out to be not real, you know, because last week Mm, we had mm -hmm. Palo and Klein who were figments of people's imaginations because of the mossipede venom. And this week we had Chambers, who was a hologram. Right. But they I I did enjoy, of course, seeing they'll say again, her and Dutch hate flirting. Always lots of fun. (laughs) And and I thought there were some really great character moments, especially between Davin and Johnny, because they did have this featured Moppet that really meant they gave us some like nice brotherly Johnny and Davin stuff, which I did enjoy. Right. I guess that's my thing about 
I mean, there there are certain shows that do this where there's like the plot of the show, which is really secondary to character interactions. So right. I'm less bothered by it than I would be if it was another show that's plot centric. Mm -hmm. Killjoys is really about the characters. Well, and it actually, as I started thinking about it, this episode, which is episode four of season two, I feel like has quite a bit in common with episode four of season one. I was thinking that too, yeah. But this is our first glimpse of Delsea for the season. And again, we have like Davin being cute with groups of younger people. I mean, the, the vessels were older, but they were still supposed to be kind of like teenagery girls. Right. And, and again, Davin just being very winning when when he's interacting with them. Knowing and, all of their names and sort of shepherding them and... Yeah. <laughs> Speaking of, he, he kind of gave Dutch a hard time for calling the children small people. He's like, children, Dutch, they're called children. But I noticed that through the rest of the episode, he often referred to them as the little people. <laughs> right. <laughs> Davin's a hypocrite. But it's cute. Yes. So I guess let's go ahead and talk about Delsea. Yay. <laughs> and her, and her <laughs> plot line. <laughs> Oh, Delsea. We we get another another established element of this world that we see like the crashy elite kind of feeding on Westerlands and treating them very disposably with her prodigy school. Which Potter calls her out on that, you know, using the Westerlands since they're supposedly disposable to her. And she eventually reveals that while it seems like they do use the, the neuro feeding to feed the kids information and sort of professionalize them they she is also using them as like a secret seed bank a living human human seed bank which i did want to define in case that was a concept not everybody was familiar with because it's not used a whole lot the seed banks are used to sort of preserve gene diversity amongst plants basically they're that's what they sound like they're collections of seeds because the idea is often with plants you know they'll try to do some breeding with plants to bring out certain desirable characteristics and, and to sort of dampen down undesirable characteristics. But if you have like an issue with the breeding, because oftentimes that might result in a fruit that has no seeds, like for example, seedless watermelon, those don't make seeds that they can then plant and grow more. So they need that reserved seed that they kept at the beginning of the breeding process to kind of go back to the beginning and maybe start experimenting again. So it's preserving gene diversity, the, the idea of a seed bank. So that's what the seed bank is doing. It's, it is protecting crushy culture and knowledge. So along with all of that information they're pushing into the kids' brains about, you know, physics and whatever, it's also like a hidden little repository for crushy culture. Basically, they're a backup hard drive. Exactly. But she's doing this on the DL because we also learned from Potter. Potter was very informative in this episode. <laughs> that the <laughs> the neuro feeding that she's doing is illegal. Even though Delsea might not necessarily get in trouble because, you know, she's all high class and blah, blah, blah. They can hardly just advertise the school as for what it really is, that they're neuro feeding these kids information. Which, I mean, seems pretty obvious based on how everything seems when they show up. Everything's pretty... Uh shut off, closed down, a little guarded. That's the word I'm looking for. It's very guarded. Yeah, it seemed like they had the kind of public face of the school, which maybe seemed like it could be acceptable to bring people to. But then when you actually got to the classrooms, it was not what you were expecting. It's a room full of coffin-sized pod things. It's unnerving. <laughs> it is. And what was so funny to me is when I was looking at the promotional photos for this episode, they had one where it was the back of Delsea. And when she first shows up, she's wearing, like, that cape. And she also has on her jacket with the high collar. And you see all the little coffin pod things. It's like, is Dutch facing Dracula in this episode? <laughs> what is going on? <laughs> She did say that she feeds on the blood of the innocent. <laughs> <laughs> that is a good point. Maybe that wasn't a lie. <laughs> it is three truths. <laughs> so I guess the reason, we should say, the reason they ended up at Prodigy School was because that's where the encoded transmission from Klein was sent, which begs some interesting questions because Delsea reveals in this episode that she and Klein communicate regularly. Right. What are they talking about regularly, I wonder? I'm not sure, but I have suspected something like this since the end of season one because Klein had contacted Delsea to 
have Dutch come babysitter. <laughs> That's not what it was. But anyway. <laughs> but I mean, it was it was Klein who'd put her up to it because he was trying to get Dutch away from Old Town. It is established that they were in contact somehow, but we never really knew what that was. And we still don't really know what that was, but I am I am curious now. And along with Delsea's comment about, I guess daddy likes me best or something. Mm-hmm. That's a weird statement to make. <laughs> what we see of the transmission, like the little blips we see in Olin's memory, it seems to be connected to what Davin saw in the memory that he invaded when he was on Arkin. Which makes sense, since it was a huge transmission sent from Red 17. So perhaps that's what Klein was doing. Maybe maybe it was like the backup that he needed to put on the fancy hard drive of the Prodigy School. I don't know. Because I did take the time to watch each of the little flashes that they show us. So here, here's what we saw. There's like an, an overhead shot of Arkin. We mm-hmm. see Klein, who's kind of like kneeling down in the snow. Then we see a foot stepping on what looks like grass to me. It's a little bit of grass coming out of the ground. Oh, I thought it looked like the spilled little seedlings or whatever that the Scarbacks had. It looked like the little pine tree type things. Yeah, it was hard to see. It was either grass. It was some sort of greenery. That was my first impression, too. But when I was looking at it really close, I couldn't entirely tell. So we'll Okay, go with, I we'll- didn't pause it. I just rewatched it like three or four times. Okay. <laughs> Well, we'll go with your theory, because I like that one, that they're the seedlings. And then we see what looks like green goo, maybe, bubbling up from the ground. Mm. And then we see a hand pounding on glass, as if he's trying to, like, escape a glass room or something like that. And then we see a woman, who's presumably Dutch or Double Dutch or whomever, running in a furry coat. We are just going to call her Double Dutch from now on, I think, right? I think so. I like it. (laughs) So definitely related to what we were seeing in Davin's, in the memory that Davin saw, but it doesn't provide a heck of a lot of more information. (laughs) Maybe some suggestion of where the green goo might have come from. Maybe it came from Arkin. Maybe it was underground in Arkin somehow. (sighs) So many questions. But we've got six episodes left. It's fine. (laughs) And I'm also curious how in the heck they're going to get the information out of Olin. From what Delsea was talking about, it sounded like she wanted to take them to, like, Pim Yeager's secret lab thing. Mm-hmm. But, yeah, I think probably it's going to be a matter of, like, Scarback meditation or something. Yeah, that's right, because she did have that conversation with Hunky Monk about helping him remember. Right. And then she said something to him about, you know, and not telling anybody else about it and... So Alva says, yes, we're we're good at keeping confessions or something like that. It comes with the sexy robes. <laughs> That's right. And he was shirtless again. I know. It made me so happy to see him, Hunky Monk, back in, back in form. <laughs> His Much shirtlessness robe. in this episode again. Oh, my gosh. Okay, if you happen to hear a really loud, like, kind of thundery rolling noise during the re-airing, like, toward the beginning when, he, when Davin and Dutch were sexy wrestling, that was me rolling my eyes. <laughs> <laughs> Rolling your eyes so hard it made a lot of noise, apparently. Yes! Because, ah, uh, that sexy wrestling scene, it really chapped my hide. <laughs> <laughs> it bugged me that Davin was all like, just so you know, we're good. Like, gee, thanks, Davin, for your permission. Oh, Davin and his, his, okay. I thought you just meant, like, the scene in general, but the stuff Davin was saying. Okay, now I'm understanding. Well, both things. The, the whole... <laughs> You know, tried and true, these characters have issues. There's some unresolved sexual tension between the two of them. Let's have them wrestle in as little clothing as possible. Roll around (laughs) half naked. Why not? (laughs) But then also the content of the conversation they had bugged me. Dutch then subsequently pinned him, but I still wish that she had basically told him, it's none of your business, Davin. (sighs) Davin. (laughs) It is. I mean, it's, it's been a constant thing with Davin, this attitude. And yeah, I, I'm with you in in kind of wishing that Dutch would maybe just be like, not cool, dude. Just just once. Just please stop Davin. But after all of that and his his weird chauvinism, there is that scene with with him and Sabine, and he's flirting with Sabine, who is the new, I don't know, assistant bartender or something, maybe? Yeah. At the Royal. That did hearten me. 
that he seemed to be interested in somebody new. I was like, oh, good. Maybe the territorial pissing will stop soon. Not He hasn't literally been doing it, but he it's like he's got his hand moving toward a zipper, ready to do it at any moment. <laughs> <sighs> it's not attractive. No, it's not. So it made me happy to see him be flirty with Sabine, who was very cute. She didn't get a whole lot to do, except to express to us that the at least some people on Westerly falsely think of Prodigy School as something good that the company does for them. Hint, Sabine, it's not good. <laughs> it's one of those things I I feel like the Prodigy School thing, it's one of those things, like it's a terrible execution of a not terrible idea. Taking kids to educate them, that's not bad. But the mandatory part, right? that's not good. No. Yeah, it was also strange to me that we didn't see Dutch react to the idea of Prodigy School more in this episode. She was just kind of like, oh, yeah, it's a school for gifted Westie kids. I don't know. It just it feels like Dutch should have had a stronger opinion about it than they showed her having. Again, I feel like it's the mandatory part should bother Dutch because yeah, exactly. Dutch is all about personal choice. Mm hmm. Instead, it felt like, I mean, which is keeping with Potter's character, but Potter was really the one saying, like, this isn't cool, rather than Dutch. And I, it, was surpri it surprised me that Dutch didn't have stronger opinions about it. But at the same time, that is how Dutch grew up. From what we've seen, again, like going back to episode 104, she seems to accept it a lot more readily than other characters do. I don't know that she is okay with it, but I don't know. Just throw it out there. That's fair. But those poor kids, because they ended up basically getting gooified, which... I know. Not cool, show. At least we didn't see it happen. Yeah, I suppose. But killing kids always bothers me, though. No, I agree. I agree. <laughs> and most people, I would think. I'm not saying I love the idea of, of killing the kids, but to the show's credit, it wasn't done purposefully. It was an accident. And we didn't actually see it happen, nor did we see the kids beforehand. Right. No, I know. It's just... So it didn't feel like overly emotionally manipulative, because that's always right. part of my problem with killing children, is that they're doing it to really manipulate the audience. And that wasn't really the goal here. It's true. But I agree with you, though. Not okay. Not okay. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for your validation. <laughs> and I also say, since I'm, since I'm giving the show props, that while I, I don't generally enjoy the cute Moppet brings out the softer side of a character storyline. They did not follow the roadmap that so many shows do. I was thinking that it was going to be either Davin or Dutch who would find a softer side to themselves because of the character. And while we did see Davin interact with Jake quite a bit, that wasn't really the through line of the episode. Really, most shows would have taken Dutch, who showed the most sort of antipathy or at least ambivalence toward children, they would have taken her and softened her up as a character by having her form a bond with one of the kiddos. And they definitely did not do that. She didn't interact with the children much at all. Right. Too busy hate flirting with Delsea. <laughs> I would have been so mad if they had taken Dutch away from Delsea <laughs> to grow emotionally through interacting with the child. <sighs> Give me the hate flirting, please. <laughs> Because I'm terrible. No, well, I, I think it is one of those things. Like, that's too standard doing that. Because you're right. Most shows would do that. Mm -hmm. Here's this woman who's not interested in children. Let's let's have her bond with a child. Because women really should be interested in at least one kid. <laughs> <laughs> not Stephanie. <laughs> I don't have an issue with children generally. I'm just not super comfortable with them. I like them once they're older. Just not little kids. I, I feel awkward. I'm giving you a hard time. I know. I know. But I also worried because they had that line at the beginning of the episode where Davin and, and Dutch were actually talking about Johnny and sort of his role in the team. And Davin has that line about, you know, this is how our team works. You lead, I shoot, Johnny cares, essentially. And so when I heard that line, I was like, oh, no, they're going to mix up the dynamics of the team by putting in this kid in the episode. But they didn't really do that either. Again, they, they showed Davin forming a little bit of a bond with Jake, but it, it wasn't really the point of, the, of Jake being on the show. Right. I also like that exchange, though, because they'd established that Dutch hates Potter or Dutch doesn't like Potter or whatever it was they said. 
And we'd kind of speculated about why that was, and they confirmed it in this episode that really it's because Potter is sort of, she's a little reckless and gets herself into trouble pretty often. And so really, at least to, to a large extent, Dutch is less worried about Potter and more worried about Johnny. <laughs> because Johnny, of course, cares about everybody. And basically, she's just worried that Johnny is going to get himself in trouble th- because of Potter, which I think is a fair assessment, because that's kind of what happened in this episode at the beginning. Right. Let's talk about the beginning a bit, because that was kind of an underwhelming reveal to me that Potter had been kidnapped by the Salt Plains people who seemed to want to sell her, I don't know, her parts, something. Right. <laughs> They were talking about selling her hair. So I, I do wonder if maybe they're, they're introducing us to the Salt Plains people because they might be more important later on in the season. I think that's a fair assessment because I agree with you. Like it felt a little bit of a wait, what? <laughs> when they revealed that that's where Potter was and, and she was fine and everything. I mean, I'm glad. I'm glad right. she was fine. But given the drama of the end of the episode prior, it's like, oh, This is not what I was expecting. I'm okay with it. And it goes back to, remember, in episode 102, the Sugar Point run, they came across some of the people in Sugar Point who had also taken people and were basically harvesting them. Right. That might be kind of what was going on here. I think they said something about maybe... No, I think they didn't say anything about enslavement. I think maybe... I think my mind made that up. The guy who Johnny talked to called her captive. Captive, thank you, yes. I think it was the the fact that there was talk of of selling her hair made me think back to Sugar Point Run and the right. whole harvesting people for parts thing. So possibly what's happening. Who knows? But we had we had mentioned last week that we were pleased that Potter escaped herself from Sugar Hill, but then we're a little kind of like, eh, when they immediately conked her on the head and have her be taken captive again. Uh, But she was pretty instrumental in trying to escape the Salt Plains people. She wasn't just waiting there to be rescued, even though Johnny did kind of help create a brawl so they could escape eventually. I I did like that she wasn't just sitting around waiting for somebody to come get her. Yeah, the fact that as soon as we see her again, she's ready to arm wrestle Big (laughs) Borna and wins. And then, you know slams down a cup of whatever that was. I assume it was something uh, alcoholic. <laughs> and just seeming genuine, generally pleased with herself. I'm like, ah, oh, Potter. <laughs> yeah, and when jo- Johnny showed up, she actually kind of shook her head at him, like, no, stay back. I'm, I'm fine. I got this. It's cool. <laughs> and then I do also appreciate, I know that we, we like it when Potter saves herself, but I kind of appreciated that she was kind of like, well, you're here now. Yes, I need help now. <laughs> I had it, but now I don't. No, I think that's fine. It's it just, it becomes annoying when it feels like characters are just always being saved. But I right. think it's, I, it's perfectly fine, great, when they when characters cooperate together, mixed gender groups cooperate together to get out of a situation, you know? It, it's not so much that I don't want Potter to just be like, no, I will do everything myself. <laughs> right. We just don't want her to be a damsel in distress all the time. I'm with you. Speaking of damsel in distress... She had that great line, I think it was to Davin, about you Jacobis and your and your damsel stuff. <laughs> she did not say stuff. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I really appreciated that line and that she didn't go hop into a pod to get the life support. It's like, thank you, Potter. Thank you. But since we're talking about that moment where she said that to Davin, I liked that scene. It felt like a clearing of the air, maybe between the two of them a bit. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Because obviously in this episode, people are are starting to comment about the Johnny Potter strong fondness for each other. (laughs) You love her. (laughs) (laughs) We, You know, there's the the fact that she and Davin were hooking up for a little while. So this scene, it kind of felt nice. Like Potter was being like, I kind of like your brother. And Davin was essentially telling her like, yeah, I know. It's okay. It's not weird. It was nice. And this is what makes this scene okay, and not that earlier scene where I wanted to smush Davin, was he wasn't <laughs> giving her permission, He was, and she wasn't asking for it. Just by their conversation, you could tell that they were checking in with each other and saying, Wait. I'm okay. Is this okay? Yeah, we're okay. It was nice. Yeah. It was just sort of an admission on her part without explicitly saying it. 
Yeah. And then he basically acknowledges that in a friendly manner. <laughs> Nobody's asking anything of anybody. Not really. Not explicitly. Other than acceptance, perhaps. <laughs> And then you mentioned the exchange that Davin and Johnny had about, oh, you love her. And I liked, I liked how Johnny responded, you know what? I'm done with children for today. <laughs> there was also a really nice brotherly moment earlier in the episode when <laughs> Davin asked Johnny, like, so how long did Dutch say Potter could stay for? Johnny was like, oh, I haven't asked her, but I'm really looking forward to it. <laughs> because, again, as established, Dutch is not Potter's biggest fan, but I feel like things will be patched up a little bit, maybe? Well, the thing about Dutch and Potter is that even though it's been expressed that Dutch doesn't particularly care for Potter, she's not particularly openly hostile toward her either. That's true. Dutch, I think, acknowledges how Potter is useful and effective, but at the same time, there's stuff about her she doesn't like. Right. Right. And there was that great moment in season one after Johnny gets stabbed where mm -hmm. Potter is the one who does the operation. Johnny's okay. And then Dutch gives Potter a big hug. And Potter is clearly like not expecting it. Right. I love that scene. It's nice. And I, I liked the follow up scene too, to that where Johnny climbs with the ladder and goes to join Dutch and she brings up Potter. And when she does, they both look at each other at the same time. <laughs> and for some reason, I just loved that moment. It was Johnny like, oh, crap, I'm caught. <laughs> <laughs> it made me smile. I like how much Potter as sort of a do-gooder trying to maybe atone for growing up with such privilege. She's emerging as a justice for the people type of character in the season in a huge way. Because she's storming off trying to leave Johnny behind because she feels like she needs to do something and tell people about the walls that are going to go up around all the towns on Westerly. And she doesn't want to get him involved, but Johnny says that friends take sides, and I just want to hug Johnny. <laughs> <laughs> I, I do like how they've sort of evolved that idea of take no sides, take no bribes, the warrant is all. You know, like a line has been drawn in the sand, and they can't do that anymore. Mm -hmm. But they're still acting as rack agents just because it, it gives them the ability to do what they have to in the rest of it. So I like that. Essentially, we've seen the last two episodes, the reason they've taken these warrants is they had particular reasons. They're trying to figure out why Klein did this thing. They're trying to hunt down this transmission. So they still are acting as rack agents, but they're using the rack to their own ends. Because that's what Klein seems to be doing. So, you know. I also liked the reveal that Potter and Delsea knew each other growing up, and not surprisingly, they were not friends. <laughs> <laughs> One wonders if Delsea really has any friends. <laughs> yeah. Because at first I was thinking, oh, it's, it's kind of disappointing. It feels like Potter doesn't have any female friends. But then when I thought about it, I was like, no, Delsea, she would not be friends with Delsea. I mean, just regardless, <laughs> Delsea is not somebody who has a lot of friends. So it makes sense that she and Potter would have been at odds with each other. Mm-hmm. But I love Delsey when she saw Potter and said, oh, great, you're here too. Best day ever. <laughs> it's a, a classic Delsey response. But there is that great moment at the beginning where they walk into the prodigy school. I know that voice. I hate that voice. <laughs> <laughs> it actually surprised me that the lines weren't switched. I would figure Potter would be the one to be like, oh, I hate that voice. But it worked. It still worked. Maybe Dutch and Potter will bond over there. Hatred of Delsea. <laughs> I don't know if you noticed. I didn't notice until I rewatched. But you know that moment when Delsea is trying to like walk away from Dutch and Dutch shoots her in the back of the leg? The look on Potter's face is amazing. She's like surprised and so incredibly into it. Like, yeah. <laughs> I have to go back and rewatch now. <laughs> it's great. <laughs> it was a great expression. <laughs> I love Sarah Power as, as Potter. She's great. She has some some great moments. So can I revel a little bit in the, the Dutch and Delsea hate flirting? I'm surprised it has taken you this long to get to it. <laughs> Honestly. Are we going to fight some more or are we going to behave? Delsea looked like she just wanted to grab Dutch and make out with her in that moment. <laughs> Delsea usually looks like that, though. <laughs> she has moments where she doesn't look like she's going to make out with her. <laughs> they are few and far between, but there are moments. <laughs> 
<laughs> just when she's really angry about something. Because there was a, a follow-up moment where they were walking up the stairs, and and it was after the the kid I'm forgetting his name Olin activated the you know beta protocol or whatever it was and was shutting down the life support and Dutch turns to her and says I hate you and she looked like she hated her enough that she might start making out with her <laughs> <laughs> which uh, does that ever happen in real life <laughs> <sighs> no probably not but uh, it's so delicious to watch on television though Chris come on weren't you the one that I was talking to about how annoying that is <laughs> That's true. It depends on the characters. I, I enjoy the hate flirting between Dutch and, and Delsea, but I don't always like it. I think maybe I can enjoy it because I feel like the idea of them actually becoming a couple is very, very slim. Oh, if yeah. I thought it was setting up them as a couple, it would annoy me. But because I think it's just sort of like fun hate flirting, I, I can enjoy it. That's fair. I accept that. Thank you. As I mentioned before, I feel like what they're doing now is sort of like early season... Root and Shaw and person of interest. You know, there's the one party that is clearly interested <laughs> mm -hmm. in something. Well, you don't know if it's mostly to annoy them or because they're actually interested. Like, you're just not sure. <laughs> right. But they love doing it, whatever it is. And then there's the other party who doesn't hate it enough that they put a stop to it, even though, like, they could. <laughs> mm -hmm. They just kind of accept it, grudgingly accept it. I mean, who knows where it's going to go from here? <laughs> yeah. But I do enjoy the dynamic as it is. And Dutch is far more participatory in the flirting than Shaw ever was in the beginning. That's true. It's very true. Though at the same time, she did have that line to Delcea saying, don't you dare fantasize about this later. <laughs> <laughs> I saw a tweet. I forget who it was. Somebody said, that's because she's thinking about it now. She's yeah, right. <laughs> That's because she's fantasizing about it right now. Mm -hmm. And from the look on her face, I think she was. <laughs> and sure, that was the only way to get the, her biometrics to that little thingy. <laughs> Whatever the heck. Sensor. There's the word. <laughs> well, I mean, clearly it was Delcea's preferred method. <laughs> it's clearly. Clearly. It kind of smacked a little bit of that moment in Xena, Warrior Princess, where Gabrielle needs the life-saving water. Maybe it's vice versa. I don't remember now. And, you know, the only way that they could transport it to her lips was with her own mouth. <laughs> <laughs> or in the, sure. Or in the first X-Files movie where Skelly had to have mouth-to-mouth. -mouth. <laughs> mm -hmm. But I was surprised they actually kissed in this episode. I was thinking it would, they would never really take it there. I'm not entirely sure how I feel about it, because I, I kind of like the unrequitedness of it all. But it's not like Dutch suddenly was like, that's right, I'm in love with her. <laughs> so we'll see. And as you mentioned, like, it, there's like the, the reason, quote unquote, reason for it. So it's not, it's not like a straight up kind of thing. It's right. There's like the excuse. <laughs> so it was a lot of fun to have Delcea back. I am eager for her to come back again, because clearly they are not finished with her as a character. Well, but... they've got her wrapped up in the conspiracy now. So, I mean, mm -hmm. they kind of did before, but I feel like it's more explicit now. But at the same time, it felt like we didn't get kind of 100% Delsea. It felt like she was caught flat-footed in this episode a bit. And so she didn't get to be, you know, one hell of a snapper in this episode. Because <laughs> that's when I love Delsea, when she's just like confident and cool and in control and can just really parry with, with Dutch a whole bunch. She kind of got there by the end of the episode, but she wasn't quite at peak Delsea. Right. Del Sassy. There we go. <laughs> So how did you feel about the diversity of the actors in this episode, Chris? Well, in this one episode of Killjoys, there were more Asian people than in the entirety of Firefly. So I can't <laughs> complain about that. <laughs> but it's not great. <laughs> I mean, as with all, all shows, really, almost all shows, it's not great. It's great that we have Hannah John Common, who's a woman of color, as the lead of the show. But then that doesn't mean you can't not cast other people of color in the walk-on roles. 
But we did have a bunch of scenes with Dutch and Delcea, so that's two women of color in a scene, and that doesn't happen on every show, sadly. Right. I do feel like Killjoys is pretty good in that they've got a pretty diverse supporting cast, but as always, it's like, they could be better. I wish that there had been more diversity of races in regards to the the kids that they were escorting to Prodigy School. Mm -hmm. One of the children, one of the girls, looked like she might be Asian, but the kid who got all the lines looked like she was white. (laughs) So the two kids who actually got to talk, I think, were both played by white actors. So that was a little, eh, come on. But yeah, we, we did get some racial diversity in the Salt Plains, but then you have the whole complication of like, but they're all criminals. <laughs> yeah. They were they were described as rapey hill folk, so not exactly not exactly the, the best portrayal there of, of our people of color for, for the lock walk on rules in this episode. And and I should say, like, this is not something that you could just critique Killjoys for. This is a problem on pretty much every single television show. But for some reason, I just am feeling the need to talk about it more recently. So thank you for entertaining or humoring me is the word I meant. You entertain me as well, but I meant humor. (laughs) Uh, Thank you and you're welcome. (laughs) But yeah, I mean, it's, it's a common problem on TV. And as I say, I feel like Killjoys is better than a lot, but still, like, that doesn't mean that there's not room to improve. Yeah. It was nice to see Pre for a little bit. I've been missing him. Pre was looking good this episode. I, I think know, we say I, that every episode, but but I liked whatever design they kind of painted onto his head. That was really pretty. Mm-hmm. But I, I liked his line about Johnny. He may be a scooch late. I don't know why, but just the way that he said he may be a scooch late, it made me crack up. Maybe it's just the word scooch. It's a funny word, scooch. It is. They used it in the first season. Uh, yeah, Johnny says it about something, doesn't he? Yep, like just a I scooch. Now that I think about it, when I usually use the word scooch, I am thinking of it as like when you're in a booth with people right, it's and you a need a little more space. Yeah, I think of it as a verb rather than a noun. As opposed to like skosh. I mm-hmm. think they're using it as skosh, but they're saying scooch. I like this theory. That's what I've always assumed. Yeah, I'll, As always, there are a lot of great lines in this episode. I particularly liked the exchange that Johnny and Potter had where Johnny said, I'm both turned on and terrified. And Potter <laughs> said, I get that a lot. <laughs> I had to rewind it to catch I get that a lot. <laughs> and I laughed so hard once I did. <laughs> I believe it, Potter. I believe exactly. it. Exactly. <laughs> That's why I love that so much, because I looked at her and I thought, yeah, I believe it, Potter. <laughs> <laughs> did you have a line that stood out to you that you wanted to mention? The one that I wrote down, just because it, it makes me chuckle, is, hell is drunker than I remember. <laughs> I, I also really liked the line that Johnny had where he, he challenged Dutch saying, you know, did I say anything when Alvis scarbunked with us for a while? And I just <laughs> like the idea of putting scar in front of everything that Al- <laughs> Hunky Monk does. Like, on, on the weekends around 11 a.m., does he scar brunch? <laughs> yes. <laughs> Scar brunch. That sounds disgusting. <laughs> <laughs> so speaking of Alvis, Hunky Monk, as you like to call him, we get the he wasn't in the episode a whole lot, but he did have that scene with Dutch at the end. And they were having that conversation about the scrolls they found, the skin scrolls. Uh. I know, right? <laughs> but apparently they're written in what did he call it? The first tongue? I think so. Something yeah. like that. They're they're in code, mm-hmm. and so they have to find out what the key is to decode them. So apparently, it's going to be another episode, at least, before we find out what those say. <laughs> <laughs> so we had that follow up from previous episode. We also we got we saw fancy fancy Lee and Klein in the ship going somewhere with the Black Root, and then the Black Root getting slaughtered. That was a pretty neat little action sequence, I must say. I mean, terrifying, but <laughs> well done and choreographed, you know? Yes, yes. Well choreographed, but that scene when the camera pans out, that was... <laughs> it was unsettling. It was. I kind of wonder if they specifically did it where it looked almost black and white because they didn't want to have the... I, I don't know what the TV restrictions are for that kind of thing, but... Mm. Maybe not to have, they couldn't have that much blood. The, the blood all over the walls. Mm-hmm. Although I have seen TV where they do that, and it's always really upsetting. <laughs> but you were 
wondering if Klein was still in his stasis pod. And apparently he was. We weren't sure. Aha! <laughs> <laughs> this is actually more or less what I thought was going to happen. I wasn't sure if they were going to go partway or if they were going to get there and then Fancy Lee was going to do this or, or what. Although that seemed like a bad plan because why go to the other people <laughs> and then just have to fight your way out even more. But anyway... But now they've hijacked the ship and they're going to go to Talon, which is the Jacoby brothers' home planet, to look for clues about why Davin is immune to the green goo. Which is dun, interesting. Dun, dun. And Annie will get her wish about seeing parts of the J other than the quad. I have many questions, though. <laughs> Such as? Well, it's just, I, I get why they're going to the Jacoby brothers' homeworld. Like, that makes sense as a place to start. But at the same time, we don't think Johnny's affected. Right. Although we don't really know. Well, he was in there with the, the mossipedes and they didn't react to him the way they reacted to Davin. So it seems like that's probably not going to be the source. Yeah. Only Davin repels the mossipedes. Johnny doesn't. So it seems something unique to Davin. So going back to their home planet doesn't seem like the best place necessarily to start but i think as the audience we have more information than necessarily klein does that's so true why not yeah that's true and again like as a starting point it, it does make sense but mm -hmm. it seems to me like a better place to start might be the military right i agree the other follow-up thread that we got from last episode was potter talking to johnny about the plan she found in Jelko's office for the walls around the different cities. And they kind of answered the question we had at the end of the last episode of, it seemed to Potter at least, that those walls were going to happen regardless of whether the cities rebelled. Because, <laughs> mm -hmm. you know, it was kind of implied that the wall was erected around Old Town because there wasn't a rebellion brewing. But Potter's impression from the plans was that the walls were going to go up regardless of what was happening in the cities. Right. Of course, you know, the fact that there was a rebellion brewing in Old Town, like, they prompted the thing that caused the brewing of the rebellion. So, I mean, it's all a scam anyway, is basically what I'm saying. Right. Absolutely. <laughs> so they could maybe use this as an excuse to put up the walls for the other towns. Like, well, we don't want what happened here to happen anywhere else. So we're going to take preventative measures. Some nonsense like that. But I'm wondering how those plans might fit into, and, and maybe they don't at all, what Klein's message to Delsea was. Because when they're talking about the school creating a seed bank, Dutch has a comment where she says, you know, you make a seed bank for two reasons, for winter or for war, which one are you expecting? And Delsea said that that depended on what Klein's message was. Mm. So I'm wondering if the wall plans are somehow connected to whatever it was Klein was trying to tell Delsea with that transmission. There's so much stuff at play here. I, I just don't even, I can't figure out how it all connects yet. I'm intrigued though. Oh, I do have a question. There was a line that I caught on rewatch and it was a moment of like, I'm not sure if this means what I think it means. Johnny says to Davin, he just lost his brother. We know what that's like. I'm like, do, are they talking about each other, or was there another Jacoby brother? I wondered about that line, too. I think it's possible they could be talking about the fact that they were separated for a really long time. You know, like, Davin left and went his own way, and at the beginning of the series, they hadn't seen each other in many years. Mm -hmm. So it could be about that, but I had that thought, too. I was like, wait a minute, are they saying that they had a sibling who died? Right, because, like, the first time I watched it, I just took it to be... Oh, they're talking about each other. But then when I rewatch, I'm like, I don't know that they are. Because we know that their childhood was not great. Right. It wasn't great. It wasn't easy. There was a lot of stuff going on. So I wouldn't be surprised if maybe there was another Jacoby brother that they had lost. But I don't know. It doesn't necessarily mean that. But I just wanted to bring it up because I wanted to get your take on it. And if that is the case, that it's hinting at the fact that they lost a sibling, they had a sibling who died having Klein go back to their home world could be a vehicle for exploring that part of their backstory. Very true.
We'd love to hear your thoughts about this episode of Killjoys. You can send them to killjoys at askgenretv.com. We love getting voice messages, which you can send us in a couple of ways. Record a voice memo on your smartphone and email it to us, or call our listener voicemail line at 972-514-7223. Follow us on Twitter or Tumblr at Killjoys Podcast. We often live tweet during the, both the East and West Coast airings of Killjoys in the U.S. and Canada. The Quad is part of the Ask Genre TV family of podcasts. To find our other podcasts about Orphan Black and Lost Girl and some other shows, you can visit our website, askgenretv.com. Thank you so much for listening. We'll see you in the Quad. Yeah, because the Mossipede is only repel, only repels, or is that the word? No, Davin only repels, only Davin repels the Mossipedes. I'll get my words in the right order eventually. <laughs> These are the words. What order do they go in? <laughs>